Uh, so I want to I'm going to share my screen for a minute and just pull up that report. Uh, I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but I thought I would just show a couple of the graphs. And if people have particular things they want to go to, that's fine. And then I want to uh, definitely get to the the bottom part um, that that someone mentioned in the go around about uh, about the APD plan going forward. So. Let me share my screen and see if I can actually share the right thing. Okay, I did it. So. I just wanted to just have us a chance to kind of briefly touch on some of these charts. I'm really not going to go over them, but I invite any of you to let me know if you want to stop and if you want to ask, you know, questions of, uh, you know, Chief Hampton. Um, I think I'll just go through it that way. So let me start up here. Here's the demographics. And it's really helpful to have these, you know, us compared to our fellow jurisdictions as well. So it's great to have that in there. And Mayor, if I can, I'll just chime in. Please. You know, yes. it, I think it's important for folks to understand that, that these are not, we're looking at this as trends and traffic stops. This is across all of the systems. This is across the arrest. You're going to see, you know, if you look at Asheville's data, if you look at Wilmington's data, we see the same things across all of these things. If we look at, you know, it, the school systems and educational problems, we're seeing these same trends repeated in different degrees across a lot of systems. So I think it's important to understand that we are, we're comparing to our local peers, but we see something like this, you know, when you look at the statewide data and everybody, the, the same kind of disparity seems to exist across all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so here's one of those that um, really seems to hone in on one of the one of the main points from um, Professor Bumgardner's presentation is that you see down here the vehicle equipment and the regulatory, you know, these these comprising a larger number for the initial reason of stops. And also, I can't see all of you now. <laughs> So um, please just chime in because I can only see uh, four four people at a time on my screen while I'm sharing my screen. May I ask a question while we're going through this? Yes, go for it, Mark. Okay, um, uh, Chief Chief Hanton, I, I have a question. Um, so, based on the, if you can scroll up a little bit, where we, with the the vehicle equipment, um, I was told by uh, by someone that the the the, the vehicles that are uh, I would say not brand new, right? The vehicle that are um, not brand new in poor conditions or more prominent uh, or more um, 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 I don't know if I'm choosing the right word. There, there, there are more reasons behind stopping them. That's what I'm trying to say. Is that true? Because it seems to me that what, what the person was saying is, it seems to me this may be correct because if the vehicle, if it's a brand new, based on the data we're looking at it, and that was way, we're talking about like six months to a year when the person mentioned that to me. And, and it turns out that by looking at this, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, maybe that person was correct. So what I'm trying to say is that, and that also linked to uh, the idea of the person doesn't have enough money to actually uh, take care of the of the equipment of the legalities behind, you know, all the costs, right? So what I'm trying to say is is that, my go back to my question again. All those vehicles are prominent to more stop. That's what I'm trying to say. That's a good question, Mark, and it. it, it 
let me, I got to answer it a couple of different ways. You know, obviously newer cars have fewer things wrong with them. So if you've just bought a brand new car off the showroom floor, the chances of all the lights working are much higher than the car we've been driving for, for 10 years. Um, the same thing would apply if your car just went through an inspection. The odds are everything works. Um, you know, the older a car gets, the more likely something may be wrong with it. That's to some extent, a little bit of the logic behind the traffic safety stops for things like equipment, because most people don't know. You don't know a headlight's out. Most older cars don't have the warning lights and things. Um, you know, it's important to understand too, though, that the idea that the officer is targeting an older car, for example, headlight violations. If a car is coming at you at one o'clock in the morning with one headlight, you can't tell if it's a you know 2000 or a 2021 Mercedes or a 1970 Mustang. All you see is one headlight. Um, so I would say yes, an older car is certainly more likely to have things go wrong. I know you know all of my cars are old. My Honda Pilot's a 2008 with 250,000 miles on it, and you know things go wrong, and you know that that's not a big surprise. Um, most of the equipment violations, and it obviously varies a little bit, but the vast majority of what we deal with, deal with is going to be a lighting issue, whether it's a headlights, taillights, brake lights, and in some cases, the, the license plate lights, or it's going to be a window tent issue. Those are the two biggest ones we see a lot. Window tent, usually they only really detect it during the day, and the lights almost always exclusively at night. Occasionally, you'll be behind somebody in traffic and realize their brake lights aren't working, but that's not very, that's a lot less easy to detect. Um, and, you know, there, there are, we have had, at least in this report in 2019, we had a lot more of the vehicle regulatory, the non-moving violations than moving. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, in some respects, those are easy violations. There's a lot less argument about was I speeding was I not speeding you have a headlight out it's either out or it's not out so often officers will you know will use see those and stop them because they're easier violations for them you know expired license plate you get behind them the tags are out the tags are out um, it, it's a lot harder to debate that afterward as opposed to I, I didn't stop or I did stop or I was speeding or I wasn't speeding so officers do gravitate towards some of those violations in places where they're just kind of randomly patrolling. Um, they're also easier to detect in random patrol. You know, if you're just driving around, you know, if you're monitoring speeding, you usually have to be kind of focused on what you're doing. A lot of these violations are ones they run into just out and about driving around. So that, that drives a little bit of it. Thank you for answering, thanks. going to keep scrolling through here. And Mayor, if I could just chime in Please. real quick. You know, yeah. I, I really think the time of day aspect of some of this is something that needs to be dug into a lot deeper than it has been. Um, you know, when we look at things like the, the, uh, the vehicle equipment violations, we see a lot of disparity. And so many of those, I mean, they happen at night. That's just the nature of most of those violations because they're associated with lights and darkness. Um, and, you know, Eli did a lot of work digging through some of it, and we really saw kind of some differences by time of day. So it, it really does kind of open a, a, a line of question of, you know, is population different at night than it is during the day? You know, how does that work? Um, you know, and that could be a result of a lot of factors, but that could also drive some of this. If we're having more stops at night, you know, I know our officers focus on a lot more trying to make more stops later at night mainly out of our effort for DWI. That's our big driver is make the stops, especially, you know, 10, 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning because that's when our drunks are on the road. And we have a large number of drunks per capita, it seems like on our roads here. So, you know, I don't know if that, how that affects things, but I think it's an interesting line of inquiry that 
is probably beyond anything we can do other than kind of this, this fairly high level analysis that we did. Thank you, Chief. And that, that is, uh, I agree that that's going to be hard to, to get at, <laughs> um, at least in, in our time together, but it's worth thinking about. And, and it, 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 re you're reminding me of something that I thought of um, during um, Dr. Bumgardner's presentation, which is that drunk driving definitely seems to fall in the category of activity you want to prevent, stop, you know. So that's a real safety issue. Um, and there's different ways to get at that. One of them would be if someone is driving erratically, you know, that's the one we kind of think about. But what I hear you saying is that at night, sometimes you're finding those people because of these equipment violations. Is that what you're saying? Or am I inferring too much? No, a little too much, but virtually none of our DWIs, or not no, very few DWI, what ends up being a DWI arrest starts with an officer going, I think I'm following a drunk who's driving crazy. You know, we see the videos and the patterns. The problem is Hillsborough is a small town with a million intersecting streets. So getting a good driving history behind somebody, you know, an officer may see something that makes them go, hmm. But, you know, a lot of times it's the result of some other violation that, that initiates that contact because we, we simply can't get behind them long enough to develop the driving history of, you know, crossing the center line five times in two miles. Well, in two miles, you're almost out of town. Um, so, we you know, we, we have a limited amount of time to find them. Um, and that that ends up being something that, you know, usually is, is a challenge. And a lot of them come from other things, whether it's a, a stop sign or a stoplight they blow or whether they have the lights out. You know, they don't turn their headlights on when they drive off. That's actually a very common DWI sign. But it's going to go down on a traffic stop report as an equipment violation. Um, there's a lot of nuance to to everything that exists behind some of this stuff. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get one, to one of these that are a little bit easier to read. And just one thing that, to highlight on this one, you know, we, again, our officers focus a whole lot on prevention through conversation and counseling. You know, we try not to be heavy on tickets. We try to write tickets when we need to. And I think you see that in our, you know, we use a lot of warnings, a lot of education. And, a, you know, I think a, a pretty heavy amount of discretion in what our officers do. Do you, um, I'm, it's probably in here somewhere, but rather than me scrolling through, do you happen, do you or Eli happen to know off the top of your head um, how, what's the universe of numbers here for 2019, how many traffic stops that is? Was that the 670 or something like that? 2684. Oh, 2684. Okay. Traffic stops for 2019. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's just helpful to have that big number to when looking at these percentages. And we don't have this data broken down by race, right? The, the outcome, whether there's a citation or not. I believe we do. Okay. Um, uh, I'm just scrolling because I don't know <laughs> what number it is. Um, and, and so these if are I can add traffic. one one other piece yes. of information, <laughs> just um, you know, to to the mayor's earlier comments about you know more citations and stuff for the regulatory things. Um, just something for folks to keep in mind. Generally speaking, when somebody's written a ticket for like having an expired license plate. Um, it doesn't have the same impact on their driving license and driving record as a speeding or a stop sign violation. So it's not terribly uncommon for officers if there's multiple violations to go with something like a regulatory thing, because it's a way of being nice that doesn't often have as big an impact. Um, but we'd have to, it would require a lot of data mining for me to find exactly how often we do that, if I could figure that out at all. But anecdotally, I know that that does happen a fair amount. 
Thank you. So Chloe, uh, I believe that was your voice. I didn't see <laughs> your face wasn't on my screen, but is this the is this the chart you were hoping for? So we've got the um, the the outcome broken down by race here. And, and I just want to say that when I know people are still digesting all of this and asking questions and thinking, but when we get to the point of, you know, uh, coming up with a report or making recommendations, which we're going to talk about at least some somewhat on our next agenda item, you know, we're going to have to talk about the stuff in more depth, you know, so um, I don't want people to think this is the last time we'll have a chance to, to weigh in, but. Okay. So here was another interesting chart that I just wanted to take a moment on for the most common reasons in Hillsborough for traffic stops resulting in citations and arrests. Um, and here's that where it's mostly vehicle, vehicle regulatory violations or equipment violations for both citations and arrests with, with the caveat that Chief Hampton just mentioned that, that sometimes if, um, sometimes the regulatory violation might be a benefit if there were other more serious things that could be charged. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and it's also important to understand okay. that there's there's not a correlation here, a relationship between the, the reason for the stop and what the person was charged with. So we're saying, you know, for example, in citation, 45% of the vehicle regulatory violation stops result in a citation, but that's not necessarily that they're all for regulatory. They could be for other things that are found, discovered, okay. what have you. And likewise, you know, 20% of, of speeding, you know, they could be being charged with other stuff. The regulatory and the speeding, I think, are two of the ones that, that are more commonly, well, the speeding is more commonly charged for what they're stopped for. But a lot of the other reasons have a whole lot of variation in, in the outcome compared to the initial start. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised to see here that 40% of the arrests, I guess, originated as a vehicle equipment violation. But as you're saying, Chief Hampton, what's happening there is that because an equipment violation wouldn't, wouldn't usually lead to an arrest, it would have to be something else that led to the arrest. No one ever gets arrested right. for a vehicle equipment or regulatory violation. That's just not, that's really not a thing anymore. 20 years ago, we used to arrest people like custodial arrest for driving while license revoked. Right. That's not a thing at all no. anymore. Oh, not yeah. even for revoked license. Okay. So here it is, this, this data is indicating that maybe some of those vehicle equipment violations are uncovering some criminal behaviors um, that we do want to, um, you know, detain people for and potentially arrest them. And who knows what the outcomes of the cases were, but um, that's just, that's an interesting data point there. And it's also a function of volume. There's just been more of those stops. So that, you know, there's more vehicle equipment than there are speeding stops. And that results in higher numbers. This is gesturing towards like, if a headlight was out and this person then is arrested for a DWI, correct? Correct. Or you run their history and you find out they have a warrant. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the next charts outlines kind of some of the reasons more commonly that that the arrest happens as a result of. That's the one you're talking about? No, I think this is the one I was referencing in my just little intro is something that um, felt worth highlighting is that the you know, the, 
that African Americans are. Um, no, this is not what I was talking about. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it was. It was. So, yeah. Um, yeah. traffic. Yeah, traffic stops um, are in blue, and um, all arrests are in orange, and um, they just really mirror each other, um, which I thought was pretty pretty interesting. That's this is the one I'm talking about. So you can so, see like vehicle vehicle equipment stops, you know, 14 of them resulted in warrants, 17 in drugs of some sort, 11 in alcohol, and then, you know, a few little ones. So it, um, this one I, I think is worth just putting a pin in to, to think about more deeply as we move forward because it, you know, this, this comes back to the idea of what it is, you know, what is it that, the, that we are really wanting from these traffic stops um, and the large number of them um, versus what results in, uh, you know, arrests or charges. So it could be that an out headlight um, helps you find a drunk driver, which is um, clearly dangerous. And then it could be that uh, an out headlight then leads to, you know, another line of questioning or searching that, you know, uncovers drug paraphernalia. So that's illegal and against the law, but is it putting anyone in immediate danger? Sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not be. So kind of what is the goal is, uh, I think that that's something that Dr. Baumgartner was asking, was, was, was suggesting that we ought to be thinking about. Okay, I'm just going to keep scrolling through. Please tell me if you want me to stop somewhere because otherwise I'm just going to keep moving down here to the going forward part. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to read these out loud. So going forward, HPD will track the following on a quarterly basis for internal review, demographics of traffic stops by enforcement, subsequent searches, uh, traffic stop arrests, the driving with license revoked, not impaired, no operator's license, and uh, possession of marijuana or drug paraphernalia. HPD will examine our policing practices to identify unintended consequences that can be improved, such as our response to higher crime areas, our use of discretion with minor violations, and our focus on moving violations compared to non-moving non violations. And HPD will continue to improve quality control related to traffic stop record keeping and to better define areas of traffic stop data that is not being reported consistently. consistently. Uh, significant weaknesses in the data have been identified across multiple systems due to lack of definition of terms, training issues, and human error. And HPD will continue training officers on implicit bias and include HPD traffic stop data with the goal of reducing the stigma of the implicit bias that is evident in policing data. If the officers better understand bias and how it manifests, they will have a better chance of improving outcomes. HPD will consider questions such as, how can this type of traffic study be reproduced? What is manageable for lower capacity agencies? What are the first steps towards being able to analyze the data? What resources are needed to improve law enforcement as a result of collecting traffic stop data? Um, I just wanted to read those out loud. I really appreciate those. That, that sounds like, um, to me, like great follow-up from that. And then, to open open the door in the conversation again to um, other uh, feedback responses thing questions this brings up for folks and again remember that I can't see you at least I can't see all of you Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And then bef uh, before we move forward, I, I wanted to ask um, what members of the group feel are kind of the main um, points or questions that this body needs to be thinking about um, when it comes to what we've learned about traffic stops um, and you know possible areas of, of, of thinking and discussion for recommendations this group might make. You're talking specifically about traffic stops, not other mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Jessica, go right ahead. I don't really have an answer. I'm sorry, but I wanted to say that I'm a little bit stomped by. Um, I appreciated the bullet point in those recommendations um, having to do with the implicit bias training. However, I. Um, ask that question to um, Professor, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his name. Um, I asked the question specifically to him and he said that um, he wasn't able to find any differences between, um, you know, people who had been trained or not, or um, like it was just so um, widespread across all populations of police officers. So I feel kind of futile. Go ahead, Chloe. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting area because I've been to a lot of implicit bias trainings um, over the years. And um, like personally, I felt that they've been helpful for me um, in my own self-examination of my behaviors and biases. Um, uh, but I've yeah, recently read um, you know, from Dr. Baumgartner said he didn't, he wasn't sure how effective they were. And I've read some other researchers who uh, in, you know, study policing who don't have a lot of faith in them, um, which is, you know, it's counter to my personal experience, but, you know, I'm just one person. So, yeah, I think I, it, it's interesting. And I, I still have, um, I guess I take the, the view that they're um, helpful, but not sufficient. You know, they're not a, a solution to a problem, but I think the trainings are, I've found them helpful. I don't know if other people here have been through implicit bias trainings and have found them effective or that, uh, that they actually apply to real life situations. Um, but I have that personal belief. Um, but yeah, but most recently I read Alex Vitale, who is pretty just, does not believe in them very do, do not does not think they've been very effective um which is a shame because there's a lot of programming that has reached a lot of police departments and other i mean so many people are retaking these trainings um so if people have heard that you know research positive research about it i would be interested to hear that as well Other thoughts on this particular area that we have covered, the, the field of traffic stops. I just have a thought about the um, regulatory violations and um, pulling people over for vehicle equipment violations and um, how that's linked to poverty or um, you know, lack of access to repair the car, or get um, uh, insurance, and um, 
several months ago, the housing department had some funding that they were allowing to use towards transportation. Um, and so people were able to request funding to repair their vehicles, which would then allow them to be able to get to and from work and then start earning an income. Um, and it really went a long way to help people. So um, one thing that just comes to mind is if people are consistently getting pulled over for not being able to fix their car and um, they need their car to go to work, then where could we try to find some funding to help people um, repair the vehicle or get um, insurance or pay their registration fees if they are struggling financially? Especially if they need their car to to get to and from work or take their kids to school. I'll just chime in and I can, I can probably show at least a dozen documented instances that I've got where the officers fixed people's car after they pulled them over and found something wrong. You know, having that sort of resource for people would be a great thing. You know, I wanna be clear that, you know, the vast majority of times when we stop somebody for an equipment violation, it does not result in some sort of bad negative thing when the end result happens you know that the problems come when other stuff is discovered while initiating the conversation about hey did you know your taillights were out um, very few people are charged with that actual equipment violation because we want folks to go get them fixed because that's exactly the point you know we realize people have to get to work we're not trying to be draconian or heavy very few of the people i mean it's usually not the same person being stopped over and over and over for this. Most people, when you notify them, you know, we give them a written warning in a lot of cases, they'll come back to us two days later, show us they got their light fixed. Um, you know, Mike Tolan, one of my canine officers, bless his heart, I can't tell you how many people's cars he's fixed. It seems like every time I turn around, he's under somebody's hood fixing a light or replacing something. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that shows that the, I think at least for us, the mindset is correct. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Uh, yes, so having said that, and I'm wondering if, um, if, if that can be part, I, I wouldn't say, uh, well, before I say what I'm going to say, is it, d does the, you know, we, uh, I'm sure the, the Hillsborough Police Department has a you know Facebook page, right? Because sometimes I think they put something in there. Uh, would it be possible to actually post something relating to, because the number is pretty high with the vehicle being, you know, not being repaired. So how can that be communicated to the community, right? Because I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, to be, you know, force to actually pamper or babysit people, but what I'm trying to say is that if those stops, right, we know for data, those stops actually um, generate additional and other questions that may put the other person into driver into a situation where they have to pay fine, whatever, right? So a fine or, or something that they have to deal with the court, right? Uh, with the court system. So now how, how can we actually, uh, mm -hmm send that information out just to, you know, it is an advisory a note or something to the community saying that, you know, you know, to help them, you know, remind you know, to fix your vehicle, something to that nature, right? Uh, so you see what I'm saying? Because it seems to me that the data is not, you know, the data is the truth right there, saying that that's a major, uh, that, that may, not among other things, but that part is really major. So how can we help out in, in, in the situation that's where, I don't know what the message would be, right? But I think, I don't know, but I think communicating it to, you know, to Hillsborough page, you know, Facebook page, something to that nature might help as a story. Thank you, Mark. And maybe keep that in mind for when we get to the, what do we suggest be done phase? But, you know, I think it's uh, what I, I Sort of getting what you're saying of the, you know, how can we help the public understand or sort of a, like the, the 9 p.m. routine they do. Uh, did you know, did you know <laughs> that these stops happen? Is that what you're saying, Mark? 
Yeah, some exactly. Well, something. I, I, I mean, I just came into my mind, but I'm trying to say, you know, um, yeah, something to that nature, right? Something that the community could, because at the end of the day, right? No matter you know the way we can look, it's a safety issue, right? Safety to the driver and safety for you know people, the other drivers and people in the community. So how can that be communicated to to people? I think that would be. Uh, So I, I do, I, um, I'll chime in a little bit on this, um, where you're going, Mark, and say that I think it's always great to educate the public and help them understand, you know, how to take care of each other, how to take care of themselves, you know. Um, I think all of that is really important. Um, and I, I think that that's something that HBD does a, does a pretty good job at. Um, I think part of what we um, are charged with as a group is really trying to think about the, the fact that it's not, you know, it's, it's true. It's not great to drive around with the, it's not the driving around without a headlight <laughs> that's causing the racial disparity. It's that next step of the search. So, you know, if African-Americans are more likely to be searched once that stop happens, for um, the for the equipment stop or whatever it might be, then what is that about? And you know, what recommendations does this group have? I'm not asking people to answer that right now, but it is you know part of our charge that we we are charged to do is what is it that should um, be tried differently, or what is it that um, we need informa more information about or, or someone needs more information about. So I think that that's kind of the next level that, um, that this group needs to be thinking about. Um, I've been curious uh, to, I mean, this seems almost impossible, but um, getting information of, of kind of following the cases through the entire judicial system. So also what happens um, in court, uh, it's hard to really analyze um, the number of arrests or searches when we don't know, um, like we didn't know there was the breakdown of drug paraphernalia that was a certain percentage of, um, or drug possession and paraphernalia was a certain percentage of uh, rest after the vehicle equipment violation, but you know how many of those were for marijuana and what amounts of marijuana versus um, cocaine or, or a quote unquote more serious drug. Um, and the I think if I'm recalling the chart correctly, what after the vehicle equipment stop violations, arrests based on pre-existing warrants was the largest category of arrests, um, and so. And I wonder how many of those warrants were for outstanding fees um, or some other kind of almost, you know, obviously it's related to a criminal, past criminal activity. But, um, you know, when I worked with criminal defendants in a completely different state and jurisdiction, a lot of outstanding warrants for, um, for not, not paying probation fees um, or um, maybe missing some meetings, but more, we would call them technical violations. Um, and so it's, it starts, if most of those warrants are those types of warrants, it starts to seem a little less fair that, you know, I have a headlight out and that time I'm, I'm captured. Um, and, and so that kind of follow up information I think would be helpful, helpful for a really detailed analysis um, about how uh, efficient the traffic stop system is being for um, making these arrests. Sorry, I'm muted. That's a that's a great question, and um, I think Hathaway might have a response to that. I didn't actually. I had a question for Chief. I didn't have a response. I'm sorry. That that no, that's totally fine. I'm sorry for the misinterpretation. Um, so then no, let I'm me make sorry. one quick comment, and then you ask your question. So I think one of the comments I want to make to Chloe's question is um, that. Uh, I am so appreciative of the data that 
Chief Hampton and Eli have pulled together for us so far. And also just a reminder that some of that stuff is going to be, um, and, and I don't know whether this is one of those things, it's going to be really hard that, that the, the effort that goes into getting it might not really even be that illuminative, that, you know, might not really tell us that much. So I, I, I would just want to be careful about I don't want us to be afraid to think about things and try things <laughs> um, if we can't, because sometimes the data is going to be hard to get. So now I'll be quiet and you go ahead, Hathaway. <laughs> I just had a, a question for Chief. I haven't seen these, um, but um, Hillsborough PD, does Hillsborough do uh, regulatory checkpoints? Um, we do. We have not done them in a long, long time, or at least very few. Um, we used to do yeah. more of them than we do now. Occasionally, if like the Highway Patrol is doing one or something like that, we may our officers may check in with them and hang out and help. But we, it's not a major tool that we use. Um, I can't. I have to look to, to be honest. I can't remember seeing or because they're required to do a report. I don't remember seeing one. That maybe. You know, I, I think it would be a handful, if that, in the last year, and I don't even know if it's that many. Um, it's just not a big tool for us. Occasionally, we'll, we'll participate in the DWI checkpoints, which are a little bit different right. than just a, a standard, like a, a driver's license checkpoint, but we haven't been doing a lot of those. We've got other tools. And, and I, I kind of just, I, I figured that just based upon what I saw, because uh, the DW and uh, because DWI checkpoints in general are are a tool that is utilized a lot, um, and they're very sp very specific parameters that law enforcement has to follow that have been tried uh, up to the Supreme Court. That they've got to follow certain things that then, of course, defense attorneys will bring to a judge to argue if they're not followed. Um, and there's also the regulatory checkpoints that do occur. They don't seem to be happening very often anymore uh, for the same exactly what you're telling what you're saying as well. That's what I've seen. They're just not. It seems like they've been decreasing a lot of folks who are having these discussions and have the communities that are having these task forces are, are coming to that realization are talking about that point. So uh, I hadn't seen those at all. And I was just kind of I was I was affirming what I was seeing from what I was guessing what y'all were not doing, which is right in terms of what I wasn't seeing in court was what y'all are not doing in terms of you're not doing the regular checkpoints. You're just being a part of the DWI checkpoints, which um, I get that. So that's another, so for, for anybody who's, who doesn't know what those are, they're just, you know, a regulatory checkpoint is a checkpoint to check on the stop. There's a certain pattern that you would stop cars that has to be produced and you have to follow it to a certain, to the exact degree um, and that gets a lot more scrutiny in public um, than than what a, a DWI checkpoint would be, um, based on the seriousness of a DWI. Um, so that's good. I, I, that's what I was figuring completely, Chief. And that's great. Thanks for letting me know that. I hadn't asked you that before, and that because I hadn't seen it at all. Well, just just to give you just to give you a little bit of data, I just pulled up the report system real quick. It looks like we've got reports on two of them in 2020. And I'm, I'm guessing maybe we were helping others. It may have initiated one. Um, looks like two or three in 2019, a couple in 2018, and then a few more in 2017. So it's really 2018, we, we stopped this. I mean, not really a purpose other than it, it honestly just became more of a headache than it was worth for a lot of them. Um, and it's, it's you know, they're, they're personnel intensive. So, you know, if we have three people out doing a license checkpoint, there's nobody else working in town. So that's not really a great tool for us. Cause you have to have somebody directing traffic, somebody actually doing the stop and then somebody else to be on hand at least. Correct. Well, you, you can do them with very, I mean, you generally two or three officers couldn't do one. You just have to realize as soon as you get something, you're kind of done. Everybody's going to be tied up. But again, even if two or three people are doing a license right. check, you know, we, we're, we're not covering town like we should be. Um, you know, even when we help with DWI checkpoints, we'll send folks to help Durham and other places will send them to help us. It's usually one or two people 
in an off-duty capacity is like overtime. We'll go help somebody with a checkpoint because it's just hard for us to do with, with on-duty personnel. Any other comments or things people want to put pins in? Okay. 